right, moving on. We're moving to another part of the world, uh, Romania. Gabriel is from Romania, and in his 15 years, he's been working for the last three years in Go. He is in, uh, he's a happy, independent consultant who loves to travel the world. In fact, since uh, last GoForCon, where he was here, he has gone to eight different countries and spent uh, at least a month and a half in each of these places. So he's uh, well wizened in his travels. And uh, he needed all this because uh, a long time ago, he was a JavaScript developer, a front-end engineer. And he needed to get some rehabilitation, so he turned to Go. <laughs> Gabriel, all yours. Yeah, hello. So this talk is actually a result of me being here last year. I'm just wondering how many of you were here at GopherCon India last year? Wonderful. So I remember a, a specific event during the Q&A last year where someone asked, might I say rather in a frustrated tone, why doesn't anyone ever talk about testing? And I could kind of find myself in that because when I started out with Go, I could find a fairly reasonable amount of information on Go, but it was really hard to find documentation on testing. And coming from a JavaScript background, I was used to using assertion libraries and frameworks, and it was kind of hard for me to get a fresh perspective on that. So as a result of this event, I figured that maybe this year I could make up for that and do a talk on testing. So I'm just gonna provide some common scenarios that I run across in various applications and present the solutions that I typically use. So the basic testing unit uh, is a function that takes an input and uh, returns an output. For this example, I created a function that calculates the average. It's not the perfect average function. It's just for demonstrational purposes. It takes a series of numbers or none, and it returns the, the average as an integer. As you can see, sometimes the average might be a decimal number, in which case it will just return the number without the decimal. But that's fine, just for testing purposes. So how would you test this? In Go, we usually use this form. That's what I saw in most projects anyway. Some people call it table testing, where we range over a slice of structures that define a specific test suit. It's the form of a specific test suit. So here we take a slice of numbers, and we have an expected result. And there's a bunch of tests for that. First test is just a normal scenario. The second test is w where you would get a decimal average, but in this case, it's an integer. Then there's a test for no, uh, for, uh, no, per no arguments to the functions and another test where the sum is zero. You run through each iteration of the four, you send the params to the function and uh, assert the expectation. If it's not met, then you just uh, report it to the user. This is the most uh, basic form of a test. And generally, whatever tests you do, if there's multiple scenarios, I find this to work really well. Another more, s more common scenario is interface mocking. My example is a simple one, but interface mocking is something you would use when you have a larger API or a microservices architecture. I just made another dummy function here, which in some imaginary program requires you to read the first n bytes of a reader and return them as, as a string. This makes the assumption that the reader will return bytes that represent characters. So we create a buffer of size n, we read from r into that buffer, and we return the red bytes as a string, or if there was an error, we return the error. This again is a function that takes an input and an output. So we, the first thing we would test here is again the table test where you would give a bunch of inputs. For example, as the reader, you could use something like strings new reader and then assert that the first 10 characters were, were returned. But other tests here could be, for example, if I pass a reader to read n and I pass the value of three, I wanna make sure that the reader only advanced three bytes and not more. To do this, we have to check that the buffer that was passed to read is of length three. Another test would be if read returns an error, read n has to return that error back. So how would we test this? To do so, we have to mock the IO reader. This is the way I like to do mocking. I just create a 
structure called mock reader that has a field read mock, which defines the behavior of the read function of this structure. There is a mistake here which I've noticed. Generally in Go, if uh, something ends with ER, it's an interface. So maybe a more appropriate name here would be reader mock, but you'll forgive me for that. So in this case, it's just mock reader. And whenever read is called on this mock reader, it will have the behavior that we defined it for it. So moving on to the test, this is how we would test the buffer size. We create a new mock reader. Whenever read is called on that mock reader, it updates the value of total to the length of its argument, which is B here. It is very common when mocking to use closure. So total is a variable this defined inside the test function that is captured inside the closure of the mock function. Then we call read n. We pass it the mock reader and a value of five, and we verify the total was updated to five. To five, and if it wasn't, then our code is incorrect. The next one is testing error handling. So we create a new error that is that is returned whenever read is called on our mock reader. We call read n again with the mock reader and a random value of five, and we expect that when read n calls read on the reader, uh, the expected error is returned. As you can see, this is a very dynamic way. Uh, I've looked into mocking. I've Googled around to find other ways that people do it, and I find this one to be the most helpful and easier to configure. Another scenario that happens when you build websites is you have a certain endpoint. When you hit that endpoint, uh, HTML is generated, and you want to assert that the HTML is correct based on the query parameters, uh, request headers, authorization, anything you might have. I'm, I'm not going to show the code for this, but let's just assume this simple scenario where you, where you have a web server at localhost 3999, and you have a page welcome, which takes a query parameter name. And when accessing that page, you would expect this HTML to be rendered you get a page that has a header which says welcome and then the name of the person, in this case, Fra in this case Frank. So what we would want to test here is that whenever we hit this page, the page renders a header and inside of it a span with class name is rendered that contains the value of the query parameter name. So how do would we do this? First, we, we do an HTTP GET to get the response from that URL. We assert that the response was 200. If it wasn't, we fail the test. And then I found it to be very useful to use this Go query package when you running these types of tests. It is exactly like jQuery, but it's for Go. So you can take the response that the HTTP get returned and parse the document whatever way you want it. It has all of the functions, and they're, they're called pretty much the same as in jQuery, except they're capitalized because this is Go. And you, uh, here we would assert that the header has a span with class name, and its text is Frank. And if it's not, then we fail the test. Obviously, you could also write your own HTML parser, but that would be too tedious, and I think it's not worth it for testing. Another similar version would be, let's say, the page is called welcome.json, and it returns a salutation that uh, is in JSON form. So whenever we hit this page with the query parameter Frank, it returns salutation hello Frank. This would have to be the same test. When we hit the URL, we expect a certain type of response. The same as the previous test, we, we do a GET request to the URL. We create a new structure that has the expected form. We decode the response body into that structure, and we check that the salutation is as we expect it to. But there's one thing here that I don't really like about these tests. And the fact is that they make an assumption with mu which might not be true. The HTTP GET method assumes that there's a server running at localhost 3999. But if the server isn't running, the test will fail which doesn't correctly reflect the state of the program because the program might be correct. So I think it's best to here to make sure during the test that you have a server running and ideally not the server that your visitors access. One common scenario, set up and tear down, which anybody probably knows in, if you've tested in any language. This is a pretty 
simple example because it's a bit redundant. You have a function that has just one single function call. So you have a setup first, which returns an HTTP test server. You can check out the HTTP test package. It helps with testing. And then we have a teardown function, which closes the server. This is a very simple example, but if you can imagine a larger project, a larger web server, or a bigger JSON API, or a microservices architecture, in that case, setup would be a lot larger. You would have to uh, configure, I don't know, authorization, enable certain flags, or make it a lot more custom based on whatever you're testing. So setup could, could as well be take a lot of arguments or options on how to set up the test. What I'm trying to say here is that it's good to spend time and make a little bit of a test framework of your own, just so that you don't become very repetitive when you test. Some other considerations when, when testing is uh, many times you can run into the problem of cyclic dependencies in tests, in which case it's good to have an external test package. For example, if your package, the package you're testing is called my package, you would call this my package underscore test. And not only to avoid this issue of cyclic dependencies, but when you write an API, you have the perspective of a developer. And when you write external tests, you assume the perspective of your API's user, which is a good perspective to have, because that's what you're ultimately interesting, interested in. Another thing I, I w wanted to raise a flag about is uh, being wary of dependencies. So even though, as myself, you might be coming from Ruby, Java, or even worse, JavaScript, and you might be expecting, you might be used to using assertion libraries and frameworks, and it might be tempting to do that in Go, but I would advise you to resist the urge and just try to keep it simple, as Go's philosophy is. I don't really have enough time to talk about this, but I highly recommend you watch The Three Fallacies of Dependencies. It's a talk by Blake Mizrani at Dotco Paris. You can find it on YouTube. He's, has, he's also coming from a Ruby background, and he's already gone through the story of trying uh, various assertion libraries and frameworks, and you can see his conclusions. Tests are also code, so it's nice to keep them clean and not to repeat yourself, because many times you will refactor, and the refactor will involve refactoring tests as well, and you don't want to cause yourself headache, headaches in the future. I remember a talk a while ago. Uh, well, Bill Kennedy said that uh, if the code looks complicated, it's probably wrong. I thought that was funny, and I think it kind of applies to testing. If something's hard to test, it's probably a bad design. Not necessarily a bad design, but it probably could be better. So it's worth thinking about that. One of the things I like about testing the most is, is that it kind of forces you to have a, a good architecture and decoupled components. Most of the time when you have a somewhat, when you feel that your implementation is somewhat final, it's good to write tests. Of course, there's times when it doesn't make sense to write tests. Like for example, you start a new project, it's a prototype, and it's bound to change all the time. You're bound to make new changes to it. Then it might be a waste of time to write tests at that point. But any other scenario than that, I highly recommend it. There's also benchmarks, which I didn't go into. You can test uh, how your program runs with regards to memory, CPU, and so on. There's also examples, which uh, test the output of your, of your program. I think those apply well to CLI tests in some cases, not all the time. Another thing I picked up in the past was uh, to make use of Go Generate when generating mocks. Because let's take this scenario. We have this uh, user service interface that has two imaginary functions, name and set avatar. Imagine we have a microservices architecture where there's many of these services. Many times you have to add a new method to one of these services, or you have to add a new service. And every time you do this, you have to add a method to the mock, or change a parameter in the mock, or add a new mock. And that's kind of tedious. And that's why we have machines. Whenever something becomes repetitive, we write code for the machine to do that. And thanks to the AST package, we can somehow avoid this. So I'll give you a scenario. Let's say you have a folder that's full of your services, where you have all of these types. Using the ASD package, you can go through each, fold, each file, and whenever you find an interface that's end with service, you take each method of it and you create a mock 
you can do this using the AST package. That's another talk. I'll have to give credit to this idea to Sourcecraft. They have this library called Genmox. You can check it out. It does exactly what I've just explained, and I find, to be, I find it to be pretty useful. Obviously, the CLI, this is very basic stuff, but in case you didn't know, this is how you run the tests. The minus V flag give you a verbose output, and if you do dot slash triple dot, you will, ru you will run all the sub packages as well. Another useful thing is the minus run param, which allows you to run a subset of tests. You could give it a regular expression too. In this, this case, I'm just running the tests for the average function that I've shown at the beginning. For concurrent programs, which I didn't go into, uh, it is worth noting that it's good to write tests that try to cause race conditions, just to make sure that you don't have any. And for those tests, it's nice to use the minus race param. It's very, very helpful. Test coverage is also a feature I like, also because it has colors, but it's also very useful. And how to get a test coverage is you run the tests normally as you would. You can use the params that you're interested in. And you write a cover profile to a file, and then you use the go tool to view that cover profile. I haven't really gone into details about uh, what the conventions are when creating tests and how to name the files because I assume that anyone can read those if you go to golang.org to the testing package. And I also recommend taking a look at the profile package. It's not a big package, but I think the tests there are really nice and it's a, I think it's a good example of how, how to simplify tests because on many projects, you see tests that are really complex or two-page long functions that are maybe hard to figure out even for the author when they finish. But this is a good example of how to write very clean tests and it makes smart use of functions and uh, it's, uh, it's worth taking a look. As usually, talks go much faster than I expected. That's it. Thank you. And questions? All right, we have a question. Uh, hi. Uh, so I'm a beginner to Go as well. So I just wanted to understand when you mock functions, right? So uh, how does it work for Go routines and channels? Like, uh, do you really mock them or like when writing a test code? for channels. And go routines, yeah. I'm not sure I understand. How do you, you write? Give me an example of what you would like to test. Uh, say you have a go routine, uh, uh, which is calling a method. There are, say, two go routines. Uh, each of them are calling different methods. So when you write a uh, test, for, test code for that, so uh, you are basically mocking the methods that are being called by these go routines. Right. right? So uh, I mean, do you really do you really mock the go routines as such because that's again uh, goes to the like kernel level, right? So. Yeah, I think uh, I think if I understand correctly what you mean, it doesn't uh, really matter whether it's a go routine or not. What matters is that the method that the structure that has the method that you want to mock is the is the is a structure that is created by you and contains a mocked function. Or if it's just a function and not a method, then the only way that I know that you can mock functions is by declaring them globally. So you declare them at the global scope var function name equals function. And then you can overwrite that in your test. Okay. And at the end of the test, you put back the old function. Okay. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, it is. <laughs> So you might want to grill him and ask him, all right, now what about channels? <laughs> <laughs> no, we just say, yeah, I just answered that too. Yeah, okay. that's <laughs> all right. Any, any other questions? I'm sorry, I, there's somebody here. And there are two questions there, please. One here. JSON response, you only consider the uh, status code. What if the world changes? How do you test that? 
if the code changes, the, the response body. if the response body changes, yeah, yeah. Well, when we decoded the JSON response, there was a check for an error. So if the response body changes, it will not decode against that structure. So an error would be returned, and the error would be reported to the user. And I think we have time for one last, last two questions. One there and. Good. Hi. So, I was wondering if there is any way you can mock out uh, the OS package uh, I/O functions. So there are there are times when I want to test some of my methods, but they call out to the OS package to open a file. A file. So, do you have any idea how we could mock them out? Because the OS package doesn't provide yeah. uh, interface for those things, but my functions actually depend on that, so you have any idea of for how to do that? I do, but I wouldn't say it's the cleanest way or the best way, but I think uh, one way you could do it if you really have to. I mean, first you would have to think about whether you can pass something to those methods that contain the OS functions. Or one way would be, like I've mentioned before, you could create a globally scoped variable that is a function, and for example, you want to mock I don't know, OS open. I don't know if that's even a function. Let's just imagine it is. And you define a global variable called open, which calls that OS open. And then in your test, you overwrite that variable to a different function. And when the test is over, you put back the original one. That's the only method I know. Uh, I know this has been an issue for other people too in the past, and this is the solution that I've heard before. So this is the most popular Yeah, this is right the now. only one I know. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so, if your uh, hi, uh, if your code is calling out to C code, um, so uh, are there any tips that you might want to uh, give uh, in terms of how you would want to test such functions? If you have C code, yeah. So I'm afraid I have no idea. That might be different tests for the specific to the C code. Because I'm guessing the interface, so C, C test would be C and the Go test would be Go. Y I don't think you could mix them. All right, thanks, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you.